Welcome back everyone. In this video, we're going to look at a broad overview of how the Quran was transmitted. And in doing so, we will present some more challenges to modern Muslim claims about its preservation. But before we get into that, let's look at the word Quran itself. Many Muslims want to insist that the word means recitation. First of all, Quran means recitation. The main source for the transmission of Quran is the oral recitation. Did you catch that? They want the Quran to mean recitation and only recitation. They want to limit the possible range of definitions of the word to recitation because they feel it strengthens their case for the oral transmission of the Quran. For some reason, they believe this is where their best arguments are. However, about the word Quran, Yasser Qadi states, the most popular opinion and the opinion held by Tabri is that the word Quran is derived from Qara'a, which means to read, to recite. Quran thus translates as the recitation or the reading. Now this is nothing new except to some Muslim apologists, I suppose, but it's been long acknowledged that Quran can mean read or recite. Let's look at a couple examples. It's a Quran that we have revealed in portions so that you may read it. It's a discourse that can be read. It's a Quran that can be read. And it's a book of which the verses are made plain, an Arabic Quran. So translators acknowledge just what Yasser Qadi said. Quran can mean reading or recitation. It can be used even in parallel with a book or along with the verb to read. But why the uncertainty? Quran is, I think we would agree, a fairly important word for Muslims. Why does Yasser Qadi talk about the popular opinion for the definition of the word? Well, if we look this word up on Quran Gateway, it gets a foreign word tag. It turns out Quran is one of those foreign words of the Quran. Arthur Jeffrey, among others, has analyzed this word in depth, comparing it to other Semitic languages, concluding, in his day, it was largely thought to derive from Syriac, meaning the reading, and there's little doubt that the word came to Muhammad from Christian sources. So Muslims, do not intentionally limit the definition of Quran in order to try to strengthen your case about the oral transmission of it. Do not say Quran equals recitation. Just admit that Quran is one of the foreign words of the Quran and its precise meaning may be undetermined. Now, with respect to the oral transmission of the Quran, how is this claim held up under scrutiny of recent scholarship? Islamic tradition argues that the Quran's transmission was firmly controlled by the practice of oral recitation. Doubts have been shed, however, on this traditional view. There is mounting evidence that the Quran text, or parts of it at least, must at some stage in its history have been transmitted in purely written form without the benefit of a controlling tradition of active recitation. James Bellamy states about the variant readings that he cites in his article, they're important because they prove there was no oral tradition stemming directly from the prophet strong enough to overcome all the uncertainties inherent in the writing system. Yet another scholar, Devin Stewart, says the tradition of Quranic recitation can be shown to ignore or run roughshod over many discernible or retrievable features of the text, particularly with regard to rhyme, that must represent the oldest stage of its performance. Many of the variants may plausibly have arisen through oral transmission, many others cannot, being based on graphic and not phonic resemblance. Numerous examples are cited by these scholars. Here's one from Stewart. The transliteration shows the difference in sound, illustrating nicely Stewart's point, though of course the graphic similarities are lost in transliteration. So we have indication from the manuscripts that the oral transmission of the Quran broke down. But how early did this happen? Very early. Zaid started compiling the Quran by collecting it from leafless stalks of a day palm tree, pieces of leather and hides, and from stones, and memories of men. Remember how difficult this job was. If Abu Bakr had ordered me to shift a mountain among the mountains from one place to another, it would not have been heavier for me than this ordering me to collect the Quran. Now what was Abu Bakr thinking, making Zaid do all this work, going and collecting the Quran from various sources? If the Quran was so well preserved in the memories of Muslims, then the Caliph should have just called two or three reciters, have them sit down at a table, they recite, Zaid writes. It's as simple as that. The only problem that Zaid should have had was a tired hand from all of that writing, but that's not the case. He had to go collect the Quran from various sources, some of them written. So we have indication from the Muslim sources themselves that within about a year, after Muhammad's death, the oral transmission of the Quran had already broken down. Now, we all know 
that the standard Quran comes from the Hafs recitation. So let's take a look at the Isnad. Samuel Green made this diagram based off of the text below it, which comes from the Islamic Awareness website. Now there are several problems here, so let's talk about them. For example, we have reports that the Qurans of Ibn Masud and Ubay didn't match each other, or the modern Quran. So how could they be in the same Isnad for Hafs? But for now, I want to focus on one specific problem with this Isnad. Looking at the bottom left of the diagram, we know that Abu Bakr commissioned Zayd some point around 633, and already, about one year after the traditional date for Muhammad's death, Zayd already had problems collecting the Quran. And now we see the problem with this Isnad. It's incomplete. Zayd used sources, and they should have Isnads. Someone had to write the Quran on the stones that Zayd used, same for the leather and the palm stalks. What were their names? Why aren't they in the Isnad? What about the men Zayd called on? Were their memories reliable? What were their names? Why aren't they in the Isnad? From the very beginning then, we see that the Quran was fragmented. The oral transmission broke down. Zayd had to collect the Quran from various sources. But just how fragmented was it? In other words, I want to know which surahs came from where. Which surahs were written on the stones that Zayd used, for example? Surahs 1 through 5? Maybe surahs 20 through 24 came from the memories of men. Maybe surahs 30 through 40 were written on the leather hides that Zayd collected. I want to know which surahs came from where. Muslims can't tell us. They want to act like the Quran originally went back to one single source. That's not the case. Now let's go back to this Isnad and look at some of the names on the bottom. These are very big names, of course, Uthman, Ubay, Zayd, Abdul ibn Masud, and we have good reason to think that none of these readings made it through a critical period in the history of the Quran in the early 8th century. And here we go again, featuring Caliph Abdul Malik and his general Al-Hajjaj. He mocked ibn Masud, saying, How I wonder about him! He claimed to have read the original Quran of God. I swear by God that it is just a piece of Rajah's poetry of the Bedouins. He also said, Ibn Masud is the chief of hypocrites. If I had lived in the same time as his, I would have soaked the ground with his blood. Al-Hajjaj would often threaten to kill the people of Kufa, should they not cease following the reading of Ibn Masud. And he swore that he would erase Ibn Masud's reading from the Mus'haf with the rib of a swine. So let's compare and contrast the opinions on Ibn Masud. Muhammad said, learn the Quran from him. Al-Hajjaj said he was a chief hypocrite who should have been killed. I would have soaked the ground with his blood. I would erase his reading with a swine's rib. And I'll kill you if you follow his reading. Oh, and by the way, Muslims, I already know every source I cite in this video that you don't like is weak. And you will reject it. So go ahead and post more of those ad hoc responses in the comments section below. Now, as we discussed previously, Al-Hajjaj made his own recension of the Quran and destroyed competing readings. But his destruction was not limited to public property like the case of Uthman, but rather included both public and private property. Al-Hajjaj was thorough, if nothing else. Remember all of those very important names that we saw at the bottom of the Isnad? As for the fate of the Codex of Ubay, the well-known Quran reader, Kalaf bin Hisham, speaks about the existing Codex with skepticism. He uses the common expression, Yunsibu, is ascribed to. Regarding the Codex of Ibn Masud, he was similarly circumspect. In these traditions, there is no longer any mention of previous codices. Rather, there is mention of that which supposedly corresponds to the alleged reading of Ubay or Ibn Masud. In other words, codices containing the older recensions ceased to exist at the time. By the end of the 2nd century AH, any mention of an Uthmanic codex was strongly distrusted. And of course, by the end of the 8th century, as we've previously discussed for Malik bin Anas, the Uthmanic Codex has disappeared. Now, as a side note, Muslims have known about this for a long time. After all, we're reading Muslim sources. Yet, what have Muslims been telling the rest of the world? They've been telling us that they have the Uthmanic manuscripts until recently. Muslim scholars of Sanalu and Coolidge state that one of the most important questions of Quranic history is the whereabouts of the Musafs attributed to Caliph Uthman and whether any of them have reached the present day. Unfortunately, we do not have a positive answer to this question. In our view, this situation is one of the greatest weaknesses of the Islamic world throughout history. They further describe how they would like to publish the Tope copy manuscript as either one of Uthman's personal manuscripts or one of the manuscripts that he sent out to various cities, but they can't do that. Now, why the lack of early manuscripts, Muslims? It seems to have something to do with this cycle of 
recension, revision, and destruction that we see in early Islamic history. Uthman revised the Quran, then destroyed his sources. Al-Hajjaj revised the Quran and then destroyed competing readings. Now what about Al-Hajjaj's Quran? What happened to that? Well, thankfully, when the Abbasids took over, they seemed to largely want to take credit for the Umayyads' work. So Al-Hajjaj's manuscript was given some mercy. As regards the Musayf of Al-Hajjaj, the Abbasids similarly attempted to replace them. In one such tradition, the third Abbasid caliph, Al-Mahdi, permitted the sending of one more Musayf to Medina after the Musayf of Al-Hajjaj had been replaced. It was not destroyed, but rather put in a box on the side. It is also likely that the other codices in the major cities were no longer in use. So let's take all of this information back to our Isnad. We have reports of all of these early readings being eliminated or prohibited by penalty of death in some cases. None of these readings appear to make it past Al-Hajjaj. As we saw, Hajjaj carried out an extensive Quranic destruction campaign, even more so than Uthman before him. The things that happened in the turmoil of attempting to standardize a Quran in the first Muslim century actually undermined the contributions of the various authorities on which this incomplete Isnad chain rests. Now maybe you're thinking there's no way the Caliph and his general could establish their own standardized reading and destroy the other readings. Two things. Number one, the Islamic world was not so large and stable at this point as the Islamic traditions tell us. Number two, think about what happened in 1924. In the early 20th century, the shape of the Quran would have seemed anything but clear. In fact, the Egyptian government was motivated to begin the project that would lead to the Cairo Quran edition due to the variants found in the Quranic texts that they had been importing for state schools. It's at this point that they standardized the Hafs version and destroyed the variant Qurans by sinking them in the Nile River. Through the following decades, this Quran quickly became the standard reading throughout the Muslim world. If Egypt could do this in 1924, why not al-Hajjaj in the early 8th century? Now let's look at some additional problems with Hafs. There is no unanimity over its precise shape. Four different lines of transmission are claimed for it, and discrepancies abound in the various texts claiming to transmit it. And when it comes to discrepancies or differences within various Qurans, most Muslims simply do not have a mental framework to process such a concept. Perfect preservation has been drilled into their minds so much that they can't think clearly about this topic. And so when most Muslims encounter differences or variants within different Qurans, they'll simply wave them off as ahruf, or kiraat. So let's talk about these two terms. Let's start with ahruf. What are ahruf? I have absolutely no idea, but neither do you. By the 3rd century AH, there are 35 different opinions on this issue, and Sayyudi listed over 40. Some even declare that the true meaning of the ahruf was known only to Allah, and to investigate this issue was futile. The problem is apparently Muhammad talked about Ahruf, but he never actually described what they were, so Muslim scholars were free to speculate, and speculate they did. But modern Muslims know exactly what Ahruf are. They're a convenient label to put on any variant in the Quran that you don't want to talk about. Let's move on to Kira'at, where things are much more clear. Kira'at, or readings, are part of the history of the text, not its starting point. The idea of different yet equally canonical Kira'at did not develop before the 10th century, when great divisions over the Quranic text led Ibn Mujahid, among others, to sponsor this regulatory concept. He argued that there are seven equally valid Kira'at. Others argued for 10 or 14. The gradual acceptance was seven Kira'at, but that was generally accompanied with a caveat that each Kira'at has two versions. Effectively then, 14 different versions were considered equally authentic only one of which was Huff's. Now, if any of this has been confusing for you, let me make it simple. The Quran has been perfectly preserved. If this were a book, we would now be in the appendices. Appendix 1, text criticism, Muslim style. As discussed earlier, Muslims have claimed for a long time to have the Uthmanic manuscripts, but the two Muslim scholars I cited earlier said this is no longer the case. They also do a little text criticism. Let's look at some data points. As known by everyone interested in the subject, it has been claimed until recently that Tokapi was one of the copies attributed to Caliph Uthman. But it is neither the private Musaf of Caliph Uthman nor one of the Musafs that he sent to various centers. In our view, this situation is one of the greatest weaknesses of the Islamic world throughout history. 
there are over 2,000 instances where there is dissimilarity between the Top Copy and the standard. They were going to make a critical edition of the Top Copy with the Tashkent manuscript, but it would not yield a healthy result. It was missing two thirds of the text referring to the Tashkent and had been tampered with. The Top Copy is an excellent manifestation of Surah 15.9. We will guard it from all corruption. So let's put these together. The Uthmanic Qurans have been lost. There are over 2,000 differences between the Top Copy and the standard text. The Tashkent was excluded from the critical edition because of corruption. Conclusion, one of the greatest weaknesses of the Islamic world is also an excellent example of Allah guarding the reminder from corruption. Now take that conclusion that an excellent example of Surah 15.9 is one of the greatest weaknesses of the Islamic world and add that to the rest of the content that we've discussed in this video. It really makes one ask the question, what would a bad example of a law guarding the reminder look like? Now, take note of their methodology. They didn't want to make a critical edition between the Top Copy and the Tashkent because it would not yield a healthy result. Christians, once again, take note of their methodology. Anytime a Muslim brings up a variant reading to you and the New Testament, just say, I don't like that manuscript. It doesn't yield a healthy result, so we're just going to exclude it from the conversation. No, that doesn't work in the scholarly world. That only works in text criticism, Muslim style. Appendix 2, Non-Muslim Scholars and Quranic Manuscripts. This will be a short appendix. Muslims frequently criticize non-Muslim scholars for getting involved in the study of their religion, especially of their Quran. Now, why on earth would non-Muslims need to get involved with the study of the history, transmission, and text of the Quran? If you do not know the answer to this question, see Appendix 1. Appendix 3, the transmission of the New Testament meets the Quran's criteria for strong evidence over claims of oral transmission of the Quran. Within the context of a debt contract, the Quran states writing is more just in the sight of law and stronger as evidence and more likely to prevent doubt between you. Allah doesn't trust Muslims to memorize a simple debt contract. About the Quran, Muhammad said, it escapes the hearts of men faster than a camel when it's released from its tying rope. If you've ever released a camel from its tying rope, let me know how fast that is in the comments section. Yet Muslims claim to have preserved the Quran faithfully in memory over centuries. The New Testament, by contrast, is preserved in writing in New Testament manuscripts as well as quotations and allusions to scripture made by the patristic authors. The New Testament, ironically, meets the Quran's criteria for better preservation, for more reliable transmission than what Muslims claim about the Quran itself. Appendix 4, Allah will guard the reminders. We've already discussed Surah 15.9 and you can see I have two translations up for you. The first is Sahih International. It's concealing something. The Arabic does not say Quran in this verse. It says al dhikra the reminder. Now why would some Muslims do this? Why would they translate Quran when Quran is not what's in the Arabic. I suspect it's to conceal an inconsistency. The prior revelations are all referred to by the same word. In context, it refers to the Torah in Surah 2148 and 21105, and to prior revelations in Surah 217. And notice in Surah 5716, where the reminder is put on par with the scripture of old. So we see that the prior revelations are referred to as the reminder as well. And Allah said he would guard the reminder in Surah 59, yet Muslims claim that the other reminders have been corrupted. So how do we solve this problem? Ignore what the Quran says and just retranslate Surah 59 to apply only to the Quran to cover up the contradiction created by Muslims who claim the previous reminders have become corrupt in spite of Allah's protection. Appendix 5, Hafs is a liar burning in hell. The Shias love talking about this stuff. I'll put this link in a pinned comment for you. We'll just go over it briefly. Awesome was reliable but weak in memorization, and we have serious statements against Hafs. According to Bukhari, he was rejected, Muslim, rejected, Anasai, rejected, not reliable, and his narrations are not written. Ibn Hamble, rejected, 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 liar, weak, rejected, rejected, not truthful. So with respect to Hadith, Hafs is a liar, and Muhammad said if you lie about him, then you burn in hell. So the person for whom the standard recitation of the Quran is named is a liar burning in hell. Appendix 6, you have lots of different Bibles, we have one Quran. I hear this one a lot, but let's take the New Testament for example. Catholics use this Greek New Testament.
Protestants use this Greek New Testament, it's the same Greek New Testament. How many different Arabic Qurans do we have? You'd have to check with Hatun from DCCI. I've lost track. She keeps track of this. 20-something different Arabic Qurans, 30-something different Arabic Qurans. Who knows? And how many different readings do we have? We talked about this earlier. Just pick your number. 7, 10, 14. Sometimes a single reading can have two versions. Oh, but it's Christians with their single Greek New Testament who have a problem. I don't think so. Appendix 7. Muslims intentionally downplay the variants that led to Uthman's recension. But the differences were significant. David Powers has collected a number of traditions, and he cites the primary sources in his footnotes. You can pause your screen and read this if you like, but you have two groups of men differing over the continental skeleton of Surah 2. Hudayfa's face turned red. He stood up, ripped his tunic in two, and declared he would ride to Uthman. And he did. He advised him about the gravity of the situation and warned that if the caliph did not take immediate action, the enemies of Islam were on the verge of striking a fatal blow to the new religion. Contrary to modern Muslim claims, the early Muslims indicate over and over that the differences in the early Qurans were severe. They were of such a nature as to cause the first Muslims to accuse one another of infidelity. They brought Muslims to the verge of civil strife and were so serious that they could only be solved through the systematic destruction of all codices that did not conform to Uthmans. Muslims need to stop downplaying the fact that fragmentation, losses, significant variants, standardization, and destruction were part of the Quran's history from its earliest years. And finally, Appendix 8. Don't talk about the Quran. Your Bible is corrupted. Have you ever noticed that many Muslims believe criticizing the Bible is the same thing as defending their Quran? The 10th century is a really interesting period in Muslim history. You have two conflicting things going on at the same time. We've already seen Majahid and other scholars, and they're forced, due to differences in the Quran, to establish equally canonical but different readings. On the other hand, the eternal Quran is winning the debate over the created Quran. Now, as the Quran becomes eternal and this becomes part of Orthodox Sunni doctrine, one can easily see how it would be heretical to subject the Quran to critical scrutiny. As it becomes eternal, as this doctrine becomes orthodox, the Quran somehow becomes conflated with the attributes of Allah. And so Muslim scholars instead turn their attention away from the Quran to the scriptures of the Jews and the Christians, and they begin developing their polemics. So when we see modern Muslims today exempting their own scriptures from critical scrutiny, but subjecting the scriptures of the Jews and the Christians to the same, we see them reflecting theological presuppositions and methodologies that have been deeply embedded in the Muslim mind for centuries. See you next time.